Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for your word. It is the truth, and we do receive it written in our heart and mind. Thank you that we'll take hold of it, be doers of it. It will bring forth much fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We've been sharing with you on many important subjects, and we've just completed talking about the redeeming work of the Lord and also about our covenant relationship with Him. And because of what Jesus has accomplished, He has brought us into the priesthood, and He has made us kings. You are now kings and priests unto God, and He wants you to operate as a king in the kingdom. Revelation 1, 6. He's made us kings and priests unto God and His Father. To Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. He's made you a king. He wants you to act like a king and walk like a king. If we're going to do that, of course, we must realize that we have been brought into the priesthood, which is a twofold priesthood, a holy priesthood. So you and I are being built up a spiritual house. We offer up spiritual sacrifices that starts with us presenting our body a living sacrifice acceptable unto Him and offer up sacrifices of praise and worship and ministering unto Him and, and being a vessel for Him to flow through. We also see down in verse 9, you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. That is a ruling, reigning, kingly priesthood. A holy nation. You must be a holy people. The holy nation is the church who is walking in holiness. A peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. If you're going to rule and reign, you must walk in the light. You cannot be walking in darkness. You cannot have sin in your camp. You must be walking uprightly before him and be a part of the holy nation. Well, as a royal priest, you are to rule and to reign. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, we see what Jesus Christ has done for us. Who hath delivered us from the power, the word power is the word exousia in the Greek, and it means authority. Young has corrected the error, the word for power it means power in the Greek is dunamis, but this is exousia, meaning authority. He's delivered us from the authority of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. You have been translated into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. The kingdom of Jesus Christ is a position of rule and reign. This particular word, exousia, really means to go out of yourself or to be on yourself because it's a delegated authority that's been given to us. This delegated authority operates through the name of Jesus. As you speak in the name of Jesus, it's as if the power of attorney is given to you as you speak and it's operating through you because it is His authority. And because He's come to dwell on the inside of you, now the kingdom is dwelling within you as you begin to operate in it, you will release that authority to see God's rule and reign come forth through you. In Luke 17, 21, either shall they say, lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you because the spirit of Christ is within you and he is the king. He's made you a king and a priest. Now the kingdom is within you because the king is there and you are expected to rule and reign. We see over in 1 John chapter 4, in verse 4, the Bible says, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, and because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. The greater one has come to live in you. The one that's in the world, of course, is the devil. He is the one who is operating over this. He's the ruler of this world, the God of this age. You have the greater one in you even though you're in a world dominated by the enemy. Nonetheless, God has come to dwell in you, and He's the greater one and will cause you to conquer in every area of your life as you walk in His ways. Romans chapter 5, verse 17, tells us this. If by one man's offense death reigned by one, which it did because of Adam's sin, much more they which receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness. Receive is the word lambano, taking hold of the abundance of grace, which comes through the word of God, the word of his grace, and the gift of righteousness, 
which of course comes from his word as well. His word is the word of righteousness. He's the righteous one who's come on the inside of you. Because of his grace and his righteousness, you shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. We are to reign. Verse 21, as sin has reigned unto death, even so might grace reign, it might reign through righteousness unto eternal life. The grace of God is the favor of God that comes through Jesus. It manifests through the word of his grace as you walk in line with it and meet the conditions. And operating through righteousness because you must be righteous if you're going to see God's favor operate in your life. When it says that it might rain, this means it's not automatic. This is a subjunctive mood verb in the Greek. The subjunctive mood expresses things that are contrary to fact that are conditional upon conditions being met. Otherwise, what's the condition for grace that it might rain? Righteousness. You must be righteous. You must have not any unrighteousness in you, which is sin. If you are righteous, then God's grace, His favor, will operate through you to bring forth every victory in your life and produce eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. You're a king. Kings have authority. Kings are to rule and to reign. And kings speak commands to see things come to pass. You are in a position as a king. Kings also fight in battle. Remember what happened to David? Kings were supposed to go forth in battle, and he didn't. You better be involved in the battle. Otherwise, you'll end up walking in the ways of sin. Kings are to fight in battle, and they have a kingdom over which they rule. The kingdom you've come into is the kingdom of Jesus Christ. In fact, the word kingdom comes from two words. King and dom is short for domain a king's domain. Domain is a territory or a realm over which we rule. You and I are to rule, and what are we supposed to rule over? We're to rule in the spirit, in the heavenlies, in the earth, over all these evil spirits, and conquer them in our life and walk in the ways of the Lord. You are to rule, and it has to be under the lordship of Jesus Christ. You can't do anything yourself. It's totally according to his word, and as you walk in his ways and make him Lord in your life, you will rule in the heavenlies and the earth over all of the evil spirits. And this is because you and I are going to speak these things into being. Kings speak things into being. They issue commands. They make decrees. And that's what God wants you to do. First of all, we must understand, you are going to be, as a king, bringing forth all the things that God has given to you in the New Testament. Ephesians 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us, that's a past tense verb, with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. All these blessings are spiritual blessings that you are going to speak into being and bring them into manifestation. They're spiritual blessings. They're going to be released through spiritual means to come in to affect your life in the natural realm. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 indicates in verse 21, Therefore let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. They've been given to you from the Father through the New Testament. Now we have a new covenant, and we have all these spiritual blessings that belong to us. All things are yours. And what are these? These are promises that God's given you. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. For all the promises of God in him are yea, they're yes. They're not maybe, they're not, I'll think about it, they're yes. And in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. Every promise belongs unto you. This is part of what belongs to you because of the inheritance that you've come into. How did you come into this? When you were born again. 1 Peter 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again. This means to be born again. Unto a lively hope, a living hope or confident expectancy by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, because he was the first born from the dead. You and I get born from the dead when we receive Jesus as personal Lord and Savior. And what's he brought us to? To an inheritance. 
you have an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, that fades not away. Where is it? It's reserved in heaven for you. This is the spiritual blessings in heavenly places that have been given unto us already. They're in the document, the legal document of the New Testament, which is in heaven. So all these blessings belong to us. Jesus, of course, is the one who, first of all, was born from the dead. He's the one who died and then was born from the dead and became the heir of all things. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. Speaking, he says, hath the last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. He's the heir of all things. All, everything of the New Testament, all the promises, he's the heir of all of them. And how do you and I come into that? Well, when we are born again, we receive Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior. And it says, Galatians 4, 7, Wherefore, you're no more a servant but a son. We're now a child of God. We're a son or a daughter of God. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. You are an heir of God. And this inheritance that you have, Romans chapter 8, verse 17. If children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. That means this inheritance is the same inheritance that Jesus has. You are a joint, equal heir with Christ. He's an heir of all things. You're an heir of all things. All things are yours. You are to see all these promises come to pass. And we're told that we are to come boldly to the throne of grace in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Therefore, let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We're going to receive this from the Lord. Obtain is a Greek word, lambano, which means to take hold of, that we may obtain. This doesn't mean it's automatic. You do have to meet the conditions of the word. The reason this is not automatic is because it is a subjunctive mood verb. Whenever you see a subjunctive mood verb in the Greek, it is a conditional statement. Conditions have to be met. When you meet the conditions to be able to take hold of mercy, then you can do it. Same with finding grace. Grace is not automatic. We've taught on this before, and you have to meet the conditions, subjunctive mood again, that you might find grace to help in your time of need. Now, as you have all these promises, how are we going to see these things come into manifestation? Because as a king, you're going to speak things into being to see all the inherited promises come to pass. You're also going to be using authority to conquer all enemies that would be arrayed against you. And the way you're going to do everything is you are going to make commands. If you have not learned to make commands, you probably haven't seen much happen in your life from the Lord. In John chapter 16, verse 23, the way we pray now, we are going to pray differently from the way they prayed in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, they would ask, request, petition to see if God would do something. It's changed in the New Testament. There is a new way. Jesus said in John 16, 23, In that day you shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. The word ask, the first word, is a word which means to request as a favor. This word is number 2065. We can show it to you in Strong's Concordance, which is reproduced in this particular program. Number 2065, if you see where this number is. It properly means a request is a favor. A request is a favor. Are we going to request things as a favor now of Jesus? No. In that day, you shall ask me nothing. In fact, you don't even pray to Jesus in the New Testament. There's a change. Because Jesus is in the high priestly ministry at the right hand of the Father, you and I have been reconciled unto relationship with the Father. Who do we pray to? The Father now. He goes on says, Verily, verily, I say unto every shall ask the Father in my name, he'll give it you. When you pray, do you pray, pray directly to the Father in the name of Jesus, bringing his high priestly ministry into operation. Now the word ask is also important. As we mentioned, there's a change from Old Testament prayer to New Testament prayer. We don't request anymore as a favor. 
The word ask is a different word. It's the word number 154, aiteo. And this is the meaning of it from Strong's Concordance that tells you the exact meaning of number 154. If you see number 154 here, strictly a demand of something do you. All of the spiritual blessings have already been given to you. They are your rights in Christ. They legally belong to you according to the covenant. You are an heir of all things and all things are yours. The way that you bring these things that have already been given unto you into being is you make spiritual demands of what is due you. You make spiritual demands in prayer. The way you make a spiritual demand is bringing the scripture promise that has been given unto you, you quote whatever the word is, to the Father in the name of Jesus, and he will give it to you. And you are making a spiritual demand of what is due you. It is a legal term, this demand. You're making a legal demand according to spiritual law. Hitherto, up to this time, have you, Iteo, made a spiritual legal demand of nothing in my name. Iteo, make a spiritual legal demand, and you shall take hold of it. In order to see these things come to pass, you are going to take hold of things. And the way you take hold of things is you believe you take hold of it with your mouth and speak it into being, commanding things to come into being. Speaking them into being releases them to come to pass. Why would I be speaking these things to be into being? Because they've already been given to you. You wouldn't be asking him to give them to you. He already gave them to you. You're going to speak what the promises are and speak them into being, taking hold of them to see them come to pass. When it says this word, ask here, which is aiteo, a demand or what's due you, it is a command. You've been commanded to make demands of what's due you. Present tense, continually. This is the way you're going to pray. And you're going to take hold of these in order to see your joy be full as they will come into manifestation. New Testament prayer is quoting the word of God, that's the promise, making a spiritual legal demand and believing you take hold of it and speaking it into being. And that is so important to understand. Most people in the body of Christ have not learned this and so they're not praying accurately. They're not operating as a king to bring these things into being. Matthew 6, 9, Jesus said, After this manner, therefore, pray you, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So who are we praying to? The Father. And then what are we going to pray? We're going to pray commanding statements. It says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Is this a request to the Father? No. Is this you asking him to do something? No. Thy kingdom, your kingdom, come. This word come is not a word where we are requesting something. It is an imperative mood word. And you and I are saying this to him. Kingdom, come. You're commanding the things to come into manifestation. So when you are praying, you're going to command the rule and reign of God to come into manifestation as you speak commands in particular areas where you're using your authority. This is a general statement, but you might generally command specifically whether you're binding, whether you're loosing, whether you're casting out, whether you're casting down, whether you're speaking to mountains, whether you're resisting, but you're going to speak specific commands for the kingdom to come into manifestation. Thy will become, become or come to pass. It says be done, but it's the word ginomai, <clears throat> which is also translated come to pass. This is a good way to say this. Thy will, your will, come to pass. It's not requesting. Again, this word, become, is an imperative mood verb. You are declaring, will of God, come to pass. How are you going to do it? Because you're going to speak what the will of God is, which are all the promises already given to you, and you're going to speak them into being with commands in order to release these things to come to pass. He goes on and says, Give us this day our daily bread. That's the word of God, revelation coming to us. This again 
is a commanding statement. You are commanding all of these things into being as you're speaking things, taking hold of revelation, taking hold of wisdom, taking hold of all these things that belong to you. You speak them into being, which is spiritual food for you. Forgive us our debts. This again is a commanding statement. Why would we make a commanding statement before God? Because these promises have already been given to you and you're releasing them to come into manifestation by making legal commands according to the covenant. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now that is, of course, our job to do. And this is not a commanding statement. We have to have met the condition. You can only see God forgive you if you've met the condition, which is forgiving every person who might have wronged you. If you don't meet the condition, then you can't take hold of the promise and see it come to pass in your life. It says, lead us not into temptation. Now, what is this talking about? This is not a command. This is a subjunctive mood. This is saying that you might not lead us into temptation if we have met the conditions. The temptation is the testing of God. God will test you if you have not met his conditions and walk in line with his word. If you've already met the conditions, you're walking right, then there's no way he's not going to be leading you into any kind of testing to find out if you're walking right. That you might not lead us into test temptation or testing, essentially testing, but deliver us from evil. If you are not walking right, he's going to test you and he's going to call you to repentance so that you do get right. Because if you're not right with him, you're not going to be able to receive any promises from him. Deliver us from evil. This is again is a commanding statement. Imperative mood again. You're making a command. These are not commands trying to make God do something. Don't get confused. It's a command to release what he's already declared to come into manifestation according to spiritual law because everything is already yours. You're already in position as a king. You're already to be bringing these things into being. You're to speak these things into being. That's what Jesus did. He was bringing things forth, speaking things into being. You're in the same position he is, and you are to speak things into being. That's how things are going to come to pass. And then he goes on and says, For thine is the kingdom, the kingdom, and the power and the glory. The kingdom is the rule and reign, which you put in operation by speaking commands of authority. The power is what will be the result of commands given. When you speak with the word, the word of God with authority and speak the commands, the power of God goes into operation because the power is resident in the word. And what's going to be the result of that? The glory. The glory of God is the manifest presence of God. So as you speak commands of authority, you speak those things that belong to you into being, the results of the commands will be the power of God will be released. That's what you're doing when you're praying. And then the result of the authority and power will be the manifest presence of God to bring those promises to pass. When we put on the whole armor of God, if you remember when we taught that, it puts the power of God resonant within you so that as you pray the word of God, you release it out with mighty manifested power and force released out of you to put it in operation. That's what you're doing. And you're doing this by speaking commands. Jesus did this. And you were to do the same thing he did. Hebrews 1.3 who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word, the word is rhema, which means that which is a something that is spoken forth of his power. This is the word dunamis that means power. So the spoken word of his power. You're going to speak the word. Where's the power? in the word how does it get released when you speak it forth you speak the word you put the spoken word of his power in operation he was upholding or bringing this really means to bring something forth to carry or also it has an understanding of 
of bringing something into being when you, you study this word out. In fact, it's been translated bring 34 times, bring forth five times. In this context, it would really be better understood he's bringing forth, as well as upholding, but bringing forth all things, bringing whatever it is, whether you're upholding something or bringing things into being by the spoken word of his power. How are you going to bring things into being? You're going to speak the word of God that's going to release the power of God. And you're going to speak commanding words that are going to bring these things into manifestation. How did Abraham operate in the God kind of faith? He had the God kind of faith. And this is what he did. Romans 4.17 Calleth those things which be not as though they were. King James has made a major mistake which has led to deceptive teaching in the body of Christ worldwide. The problem is be present tense verb. Were would be a past tense. Do I speak the things which be not that are not happening right now as though they already were done and already were happening? I declare it's already done. That's the faulty word of faith teaching which is error because they have made a mistake. How can I say that? I'll well, show you. Calleth, first of all, is a present tense verb, meaning I'm calling and continuing to call. The present tense in the Greek means continuous ongoing action. It's important whenever there's a present tense verb. I am continually to call and keep calling until I see something manifest, call it into being. Calling continually those things which be not. This word is a present participle in the Greek. It is a word which would be translated being. Here's the present participle. Being. I'm continually calling those things not being as though the King James says they were. If I put the cursor over the word were, it is the exact same word in the Greek, a part present participle, meaning being. Why did they translate it were? It's error. It's a great mistake. It has given rise to the false teaching from the word of faith, especially calling things as though they already were done and doing it one time and saying it's already happened. <laughs> no, that's not what it says whatsoever. You are calling continuously continuously, things that are not being, not occurring, as occurring, being. In other words, you're speaking them into being to bring them into being. And I can show you this even from the Greek. For those of you who may not know Greek, but you'll be able to see this. These are the last two words, be and what was translated in the King James were. Here's the first one. It is this present participle that we mentioned which is, means to be. Here's the second one. I've moved the cursor away. It's the exact same one, present participle, par, present participle, which also means be. In fact, you can even see this. Look at these words for a second. That's an O, which is an omicron. That's what looks like a V, but it's a new. It's an N sound. That's a T, which is a ta. This is an A, which would be an alpha. And it has a little rough, a little ac accent above it and a breathing mark, if you can see that above the O. Now look at the second one over here. It's got the same O, this V that looks like a V, but it's an N, the T and the A, with a, a breathing mark and an accent above it. It's the same word, which means they're both the same. If it went from present to past tense, it wouldn't be the same word. It would be a different word. The King James made a great mistake. Young's corrects it. Is calling the things that are not being as being. This is critical because when you speak things, you are going to call those things that are not being or not happening as being and happening. In other words, you're calling them into being continuously that are not being. You're speaking them into being that's not happening. If healing is not occurring, you're going to speak healing into being continuously so it does come into being. Every time you speak it, it is working to bring that into being. 
not as though it already was done. This one-time teaching is great error in the body of Christ. All these prayer scriptures are all in present tense scriptures, as well as speaking to the mountain or casting out demons, and we've illustr shown you that in the past. So we call things, we speak things into being. Kings speak things into being. You're a king, remember. And also, what else do you do? You're going to hold fast speaking these things into being because what are you doing when you're speaking things into being? You are confessing the promises, speaking them into being to bring them to pass. Hebrews 4.14. We talked about Jesus now our high priest at the right hand of the Father in a high priestly ministry. Hebrews 4.14. Seeing we have a great high priest that's passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, what's he doing? Remember, we talked about, if you heard the message on it, the present ministry of Jesus, he's not sitting up there doing nothing. He is doing something. And one of the, he's the high priest. He takes what we speak, the confession, and confesses it before the Father, and he also confesses it before the angels to put them in operation. Notice what it says. He's passed in the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Profession is the confession or the things we're speaking into being, which are the promises of God, the Word of God. We're speaking these things into being to bring them into manifestation. When it says, hold fast, this particular word is not a one-time thing. It is a present tense verb, meaning you continually hold fast speaking these things into being. And it has to, shows that it's a subjunctive mood, meaning that the only way you're going to see the high priestly ministry of Jesus be working an operation for you continually is if you meet the condition of holding fast continually your confession of speaking the word, speaking the promises into being. That's why Young's translate, may we hold fast the profession. May we be holding fast, speaking these things into being continuously to bring them into being. That's why you need to make your mouth work for you. Hebrews 10, 23 says something very similar. Let us hold fast. Same thing. We're going to hold fast, present tense, subjunctive mood, meaning it's a conditional thing. You have to do it in order to see things happen. The confessing. Now, by the way, it says of our faith. This is an error. The speaking into being is not the speaking of our faith. It is the speaking of our hope, which is a release of our faith. What are we speaking? The hopes into being. Why do I say that? Because I put the cursor over the word faith. It is the word el peace. The word el peace in the Greek means hope. It's been used 54 times in the Greek, 53 times it's translated hope correctly. One time erroneously translated faith here. Every translation out there, you look at any of them, they all have corrected this King James error. How anybody can say the King James Version is a perfect version is unbelievably, they lost their minds. If they would look at the Greek, they'd understand <laughs> that's totally wrong. And there's unbelievable number of ministers and teachers and even Bible schools that declare this. Great error. The King James has a tremendous number of errors as we have seen. Let us hold fast the profession of our hope without wavering. You can't be wavering because you're going to continually speak this into being until it comes into manifestation. Kings continually command things into being until you see the results. And of course, why would I never waver? Because he's faithful that promised. I know he's going to bring it to pass. I know that as I speak these things into being, God will bring all these promises to pass. You are to speak things into being. Kings decree things. Job 22, verse 28. Thou shalt also decree a thing. You're going to decree something and it shall be established unto you. You decree a thing when you command, you speak things into being. You make decrees. This is what you're doing when you're speaking the promises of God. You're making decree according to what belongs to you, 
to see these things come into manifestation. A decree is an official order given by one in authority, and it's official statement that you speak these things to release these things, and they will be performed to come into manifestation. You are going to do this. Isaiah chapter 45, if you've wondered if, well, I see a lot of this, but I'm not so sure about all this commanding stuff. Well, this should absolutely settle any doubts that you have. Isaiah 45, 11, Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and His Maker, ask me of things to come concerning my sons, and concerning the work of my hands, all these promises that He brings to pass. Command ye me. We command Him. How do we command Him? By speaking His Word, operating in the authority that's been given unto us, in the New Testament, speaking in the name of Jesus, in our position as a king, and we speak these things into being to see them come into manifestation. You make commands. When Jesus was doing things, he made commands. How are you going to bring things into being? You're going to make commands. Here's when they're walking, he's, walk, walk, they're walking, he's walking on the water and they're wondering who he is, you know. Notice what he said every time when he's speaking to him. Straightway Jesus spake it to him, he said, be of good cheer. When he spoke to that, he didn't, he didn't give them a nice little suggestion. He commanded them, be of a good cheer or be of good courage, essentially. It means good courage. It's I. Be not afraid. Don't be afraid. And these are commanding statements he makes to him, imperative mood in every case. Jesus continually made commands. Everything that he did, he was speaking things into being with commands. We see over in Matthew chapter 15, verse 28. Here's this woman, woman with the, had the, daughter that has vexed of the, with the evil spirits. If you remember back here, the daughter was grievously vexed with the evil spirit, and Jesus wouldn't even answer her a word until she called him Lord. She indicated it was the children's bread, which was deliverance, is only, is only for those who are in covenant relationship. They can't cast it to the dogs. But she understood this revelation and said the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Otherwise, I understand that the gospel's coming to the Jews first, but it's coming to us after that. It's coming to us. She understood that. And Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee as thou wilt. When he spoke that, he spoke a command to release this to come to pass. And what happened? Her daughter was delivered and made whole from that very hour. He spoke a command into being commanding statements. That is what you are going to do. When you cast demons out, you don't ask the Father to get rid of them. You command them to come out. Mark 1.25, Jesus rebuked him, speaking about this evil spirit, that guy, unclean spirit of this man in the synagogue. Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. When he commanded them to come out of him, this is a command. And by the way, Jesus didn't speak this just one time because the word saying tells you how he spoke it. He spoke it, and then he spoke it, and then he spoke it, and continued to speak it because this is a present tense, which would mean Jesus rebuked him saying and continuing to say to him, hold thy peace and come out of him. Why did he need to continue to command it? because the demon couldn't come out right away. The unclean spirit tore at him for a while. And when the spirit had torn him, he, then he cried with a loud voice and came out of him. Jesus continually released authority, commanding the demon to come out. That shows you demons have power and they could even resist in the face of Jesus. Another case was over down in Mark chapter 9, in verse 25. He said, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him. And was this a commanding statement? Absolutely. He spoke commands to cast the demon out. 
Now, when he was saying to him, was he just saying it one time? No. Present tense for saying. He was continually saying it. And why did he need to do it? Because the spirit cried, rent him sore. He was tearing at this guy before he came out of him. And he came out, and when he came out, he came like he was one dead, fell down like he was dead. It must have really been quite a fight with this demon within him. They said, he's dead. Now, Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up, and he rose. But the point being is, he spoke commanding words, and he continually spoke commanding words to bring things into being. We also see everything that Jesus was speaking. Mark chapter 1, verse 41. Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand, touched him. It's the man who believed that Jesus was able to make him clean, if thou wilt, remember. If thou wilt, you can make me clean. And he said, I will, be thou clean. He didn't say, I will, I'll pray to the Father and we'll see if something gets done here. No. Be thou clean. This is a commanding statement. He spoke it into being and power of God went in operation to cleanse him of that leprosy. And he was. As soon as he spoke, immediately leprosy departed from him and he was cleansed. So sometimes you speak things and they happen immediately. If they happen immediately, you don't need to speak it again. Other times you speak it and it didn't happen as far as manifestation, so you keep speaking and keep speaking until it does come into being. In other words, you don't speak just once and then think that that's all you do. You keep speaking until you see the results. Mark chapter 5, verse 34. This the woman had the issue of blood. He said to her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. A commanding statement. Imperative mood. Be whole of thy plague. Again, the word be. Be thou whole. This is the commanding statement again. He spoke these things into being. You are going to speak commanding words to bring things into being. Mark chapter 5, a little farther down. This is the man from, who heard the, the report. Mark 5, 35. The ruler of the synagogue heard that his daughter was dead. Remember, he was on his way to minister to her. She was at the point of death, so it shouldn't have been any surprise that she died. Your daughter's dead. Of course, the temptation came. Why trouble thou the master any further? So what did Jesus do? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the rule of the synagogue, Be not afraid. When he spoke, Be not afraid. This is a commanding statement here. Wherever it's at. I think it's... Be not afraid. I don't know where the verb part is. Must be underneath it, maybe. Hmm. But that's what it is. Maybe it's under the fret of this one over here. I don't know where they got the verb part. It is a command, be not afraid. And only believe, this is also a commanding statement. They're, they're both commanding statements. Otherwise, he's commanding something. He's speaking commands. He's not praying to see if maybe, you know, the Father will do something. This is the point. You are going to speak commands to bring things into being. In fact, when he comes and he, he now is ministering to this woman, who's, who's dead, remember, took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, here, tali kumai, which would be interpreted, damsel, I say unto thee, arise. What did he say to her? He commanded her to arise imperative mood. His command of authority released the power of God, and what happened? <laughs> she was raised from the dead. She rose, walked, 12 years old. She was raised from the dead. He spoke these things into being. God wants us to understand you're going to speak things into being. You need to believe that when you speak that you are releasing authority and power, and it is happening. Mark chapter 7, verse 34. This is when the person took his fingers and her ears, spit, touched his tongue, 
looked up to heaven's side, said, Ephphatha, which means be opened. What was he doing? He spoke a commanding word, imperative mood. He commanded it to be opened. You're going to speak it. Be opened in the name of Jesus. You're going to speak commanding words to speak things into being. That is what he wants you to be doing. How about when he's on the water? Mark chapter 4, down in verse 39. The wind rises up, a violent wind. He said to it, peace, be still. Those are commanding statements. He commanded this thing to stop. Stop. Be still this means to stop, essentially. Like, stop the mouth, stop. A commanding statement. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He's speaking things into being. Every place you see, Jesus was commanding things into being. John chapter 5. And we're taking the time to show you this, to drive these points home to you. God wants you commanding things into being. You're a king. You're to issue commands and to speak things into being. John chapter 5, verse 8. Jesus said, rise, take up thy bed and walk. All of these, these are, this rising up here, are all statements, commanding, imperative mood statements. Take up thy bed and walk. When he commands this guy to walk, he tells him to get up and start walking. You and I are to command things into being. We're not supposed to just wonder if God's going to do something. Acts chapter 3. This is with Peter and John. They go up to the temple, the hour of prayer, be in the ninth hour. A certain lamb man, man lame from the mother's womb was carried. He's sitting there asking of alms. He's looking for money. Peter and John about to go into the temple. He asked them of some for alms, for money. They look at him and they said, look on us. He gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something, to take something from them. He thought he was going to get money. Peter, and said, Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He spoke commands. Rise up, imperative mood. He didn't say, I'm going to pray to the Father. No. He said, rise up and walk. Get up and walk in the name of Jesus. He released authority and power and spoke it into being. <laughs> what happened? He took him by the right hand, lifted him up. He had no doubt. Immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. They were made firm. The power of God went into operation. And this guy, leaping up, stood, walked, and entered the temple, walking, leaping, and praising God. He issued commands. They, issued com they spoke commands into being. This is what God wants. <coughs> now, John chapter 11. Here's Lazarus being raised from the dead. Now, a couple things. First of all, let's back up for a moment. Jesus is on his way to raise Lazarus from the dead. This doesn't mean you're not going to be praying before you issue commands. In this case, he's groaning in the spirit as he's coming to the grave. He's in deep intercession. When it comes up here and it says Jesus wept, this is a word which goes back to Hebrews 5, 7, where 11.44 is used. This is not wailing tears because of someone being dead. This is tears of intercession. Deep intercession, groaning in the Spirit. Hebrews 5, 7, speaking of Jesus, through the days of His flesh, when He offered up prayers and supplications, strong crying and tears, tears, Number 1144, the tears of intercession unto him was able to save him from death. He was in deep intercession. Jesus again, coming up to the grave. We go back to John 11. We saw verse 33 and 35. Now we come down to verse 38. He's continually, Jesus again, groaning in himself. 
cometh to the grave. This is him, deep intercession. So he was praying and interceding in the spirit, releasing the prayer, authority, and power against these enemies. So you're going to pray a lot of times before you go and issue commands. He was breaking things in the realm of the spirit. But then when he comes up to him, what does he do? He tells him to take away the stone, of course. And he also says that the fact to know that he was He'd already been praying about this long before. He lifted up his eyes, John 11, 44, 41, and he says, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. Meaning he'd been praying to the Father prior to this. And what you're going to do, you're going to pray prior to things. I knew that thou hearest me always. You've got to know that. Don't wonder if he heard you. You've got to know he always heard you if you pray accurately in line with the word. Because of the people stand by, I said it, that he might believe that thou hast sent me. But then now, when he speaks, he speaks commanding words. When he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. He's commanding him to come forth. And this is, again, he's telling him to come forth. Commanding statements. And of course, what happened? The dead came forth. He was raised from the dead. He prayed and interceded before conquering the spirit's operation in the realm of the spirit. And then he commanded those spirits that commanded the person to be raised from the dead, to speak it into being, to release it, to come to pass. You're going to command things into being. When you speak to a mountain, we've talked about this in the past, but we need to speak about it today. Mark 11:23. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever you shall say to this mountain, be thou removed, and be thou cast in the sea. These are commanding statements that you make. You are going to command a mountain to be removed. Shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he says. Now, did he say it just one time? No. The word saith that you see me putting the cursor over, present tense. The things which he was saying and continuing to say ongoingly. Then it says, shall come to pass. That's a mistake also. It's not a future tense verb. Shall would mean future tense. Is it a future tense? No. It is a present tense. How would you translate this? Believe that those things which he sa says and are continuing to say are coming to pass. In other words, every time you speak, you must know and believe it is coming to pass at that point in time. It's working, it's working, it's working, it's working. Right then and there. That is applying your faith to move the mountain. We should know this clearly and how this is so easy for us to understand who understand deliverance. Because what are you doing when you start commanding the demon to come out? You command it to come out, maybe it didn't release out yet with the yawn, cough, sigh, or release of breath, out comes out. But you know it was starting to work, and you continue to command, continue to command, continue to command, and then they started coming out. Every time you spoke, you knew something was happening. Authority and power is being released. Authority and power is being released. Authority and power is being released. And then fi finally the demons start to come out and release out. Otherwise, it's the same thing in everything else. Whether you're speaking to a mountain or anything you're doing with your faith, you're speaking it continually. Every time you speak it, it's happening, it's happening, it's happening, it's happening. You're calling those things not being as being. It's happening, it's happening to bring it into manifestation. You keep speaking into being until it's manifest. You declare healing power is flowing into my body. It's continually flowing. You keep speaking it and speaking it into being. It's happening. And you keep speaking it to be until it's manifest. This is the way you release things in the realm of the Spirit to see God accomplish these great works. And He will do it. Everything that He says in His Word, He will bring to pass. You make commands to bring things into being. This is the way a king operates. Kings make commands. They have authority. 
Matthew chapter 8, verse 5, Jesus entered into Capernaum, came a centurion, beseeching him, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. Now, the centurion is over a 100 Roman soldiers. He's a guy who's over these soldiers, telling them what to do. Jesus said, I will come and heal him. The centurion said, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, I'll come under my roof because he's a, he's a centurion, he's a Roman. But he understood something because he'd seen what Jesus had done. Speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. He's telling them, you just speak the word, speak this, commands, make commands of with your mouth, of speaking commanding words, imperative mood, and my servant shall be healed. It'll happen. Jesus, and of course, then he goes on and says, I'm a man under authority, which is a key, meaning he is submitted unto the Roman government. You got to be under the king of kings, the Lord Jesus, walking right with him. If you're not walking right, you're, the, you're operating as a king is not going to do anything. Your words will go nowhere. You got to be right with him under authority, being submissive to him. He says, having soldiers under me. See, he understood this principle. I see how this works. I know how authority works. I say to this man, go, and he goeth. He speaks commanding words, and it happens. To another, come, and he cometh. To my servant, do this, and he doeth it. He understood how this works to release authority. And he saw Jesus having authority over the demons and over the sickness, and he understood this is how this works, the same way that I operate in making commands to those that are under me. The devils and sickness and disease and every work of the enemy is under you. You're an authority. You're a king. You are to speak these things into being. And what was Jesus' response? When he heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. These guys have great faith. This guy has great faith because he understands how this thing works with commanding words of speaking things into being. So, then of course, he comes down here, he says, Go thy way, as thou hast believed, so thou done unto thee. Of course, he believed, and he told him to go thy way. This guy had believed, and Jesus spoke that into being. Tell him to go, his servant was healed the self-same hour, because he understood how authority works. And that's what you and I must understand. We are going to make commands. Here we see in Acts chapter 14, verse 10. Here's Paul. We go back to verse 8. This is a guy at Lystra, impotent in his feet. He's a cripple from his mother's womb, never walked. Same heard Paul speak. Steadfast to beholding him, receiving he had faith to be healed. Otherwise, Paul picked up that this guy believes what I'm saying. He's believing the word. He has faith to be healed. He just needs to do something. And so, he says with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet. He commands him to get up, essentially. Get up on your feet. And he leaped and walked. He released that authority because the guy had faith. If you have faith, you can command things into being. And he got up and he walked and he was healed and he was set free. God wants us to understand. We have authority and dominion. Matthew chapter 8, verse 24. Behold, there's a great tempest. This is a different word, seismos, which is what the word for like an earthquake. Seismos, it's a word for like an earthquake in the sea. The devil caused an earthquake in the sea. The devil does this, you know. Insomuch that the ship was covered with waves and he was asleep, the devil was going to, we're going to drown him out. We're going to cause an earthquake. It's exactly what happened. The disciples came to him and awoke and said, Lord, save us, we perish. Of course, they didn't, you know. And then he rises and he says, oh, why are you so fearful? He already been teaching him these things, see. Oh, ye of little faith, meaning if we're not understanding this, we're not even operating in much faith at all. We're of little faith. 
He arose and he rebuked the winds and sea, and there was a great calm. He just rebuked those winds. He commanded those. Well, here, this is indicative. He arose and rebuked the winds. It doesn't say, say how he did it there. And he was in the sea, and there was a great calm. He would speak things. He would command, make commands. And that's how he would stop things and see things come to pass. In Mark's accounts, where it has said that, if we go over to Mark's account, you'll see the command that he makes. Mark chapter 4, in verse 39, here's where the waves were filling the, rebuked the wind and said, peace be still. These are the commanding statements and the wind ceased. That was when the water was filling the, the ship. God wants you to know that you are to make commands. Matthew chapter 9. Most Christians never hardly ever make commands. We should be making commands of everything, speaking them into being. Then he touched their eyes saying, according to your faith, be it unto you, come to pass, or more literally, let it be unto you or come to pass. When he makes this statement, it's an imperative mood. He's commanding it into being according to your faith. That means your commands will work according to your faith. You need to put your faith in operation by start commanding things into being and keep doing it until you see results. And develop your faith. God wants you to start putting your faith in operation at all times. In fact, over in Mark, chapter 11, we saw verse 23, but here's verse 22. Jesus answering said, have, and this is a present tense imperative. He's essentially saying, be having faith. And it's not in God, it's of God. It's a genitive in the Greek. It literally means be having faith of God. You're to be having this faith and put it in operation. The next thing is where he's talking about speaking to the mountain. The next thing he's talking about after that is the prayer of faith, where you take hold of promises. So when you're praying for promises, you're going to pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. You're going to be speaking the, the, what belongs to you, the promise making the demand of what's due you by the scripture promise and take hold of it, believe you take hold of it, and speak it into being. When we're speaking about casting out demons or stopping the works of the devil or doing the works of God or speaking to mountain or whatever it might be, you're going to speak commanding words to speak these things into being. Again, this is every place. How is your faith going to get developed? by you using it. Luke 17, 5, the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. Hey, we got to get our faith going. We understand this is how you're doing this. The Lord said, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say unto the sycamine tree, be thou plucked up. Otherwise, start speaking commanding words. You're going to speak these commanding words. Again, imperative mood. Be plucked up. Be cast out. Be, be removed. Be thou plan the sea and it should obey you. Start speaking, commanding words. That will cause your faith to grow as you apply it and apply it and begin to work it. We need to keep speaking it. Faith will be in operation when you're speaking the commanding words and as you use it, that will develop your faith. And that's what he wants. We can also see this and understand this from Luke 18.1. He spake a parable unto him to this end, that men must, necessary, always pray and not faint. And this is talking about saying there was a city, in the city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. He's an unjust God, an unjust judge. There's a widow in that city, and she came and said, avenge me of my adversary. She wants to be avenged of her adversary. She didn't come and ask him to do something. She commanded the unjust judge, avenge me of my adversary. Well, he would not for a while. But afterward, he said with himself, though I fear not God, 
nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, because she kept coming and coming and coming and coming and coming. Avenge me, avenge me, avenge me, avenge me. I will avenge her. Lest by her continual coming, it shows that she did it continually. That's what you and I do. Of course, he says, she weary me. The Lord said, hear what the unjust judge saith. Shall not God avenge his own elect, which cried day and night unto him continuously? Though he bear long with them, and he certainly will. I tell you, he will avenge them speedily, with quickness and speed. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Because what does it take? Faith. Faith put, learned how to put in operation and used and continually put in operation and developed to become strong. Your faith is to grow exceedingly. Your faith is to become strong. Your faith is to move every mountain. Your faith is to be, you're to be full of faith and strong. That's what happened over in the book of Acts. And the same thing's going to happen in the New Testament end time church. Remember, the glory was poured out on the first church, but the greater glory is going to be poured out on the end time church because the end time church is going to be doing the same things that these guys did. You're looking for somebody full of the Holy Ghost and full of wisdom. They found somebody full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. You need to get full of faith and you need to get full of the Holy Spirit. And of course, what happened? These guys were obedient. St Stephen was full of faith and power. He did great wonders and miracles among the people. Full of faith and power. That's what God wants. He wants you to get full of faith and power. You are going to command things into being and speak things into being. Every single case with Jesus. Here's the blind man. Luke 18, verse 42. He said, Receive thy sight, thy faith has saved thee. Commanding statement here again. When he speaks there. Imperative mood. Speaking it into being. You are going to speak commands to release the authority and the power of God to see God bring forth everything that he purposes. When it tells you to fight the good fight of faith, this is a command. You are going to fight this fight. 1 Timothy 6.12, fight the good fight of faith. That is a command. You are commanded to do this. Lay hold on eternal life. All these things, all these promises, that is a command. You and I are commanded to take hold of everything that belongs to us. You take hold of the promises, you speak these things into being, you put your faith in operation to conquer every enemy in your life. When you resist the devil, you do the same thing. You speak commands. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8, talks about how the devil seeking whom he may devour. Whom resist, you are to resist imperative mood commanding you to resist him steadfast in the faith. You resist him. He commands you to do it. You command and you keep doing it. Keep resisting the enemy until he is eliminated and put under foot. You are going to pray and speak these things into being. Every promise, just like we talked about. You're going to be taking hold of these things. Mark 11, 24, what things are ever you, I tell you, demand of what's due you, not desire. When you pray, believe that you take hold of them and you shall have them. When it says believe you take hold of them, the word believe is a command. He commands you to believe that you take hold of them. You and I are going to take hold of everything. And we're going to speak these things into being. And we're going to do it with thanksgiving because it's already been given to us. That's why you always pray with thanksgiving to speak every promise into being. Now the devil, he's trying to get to you. In fact, the devil demands you to destroy you. 
Look what it was he said about, what Jesus said about, just to, this is Peter, Simon, Simon, but he also was called, it was Peter. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded, it's a form of the word aiteo, it's ex aiteo mai. He's demanded to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. Satan demands to have you. You're not going to let him do anything. And he does these things, of course, according to spiritual law. That's why he accuses of, the, of us of our sins night and day, remember? He accuses of our sins before God to get a spiritual legal right according to, to spiritual law. And that's how he can do his destructive work. And he does bring these things to pass. Of course, his answer was, I prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. Otherwise, you'll conquer these attacks if you get your faith in operation. Now, could your faith fail? He said that your faith fail not. Subjunctive move. That your faith may not fail if you meet the conditions. Do you have the faith of Jesus? Yes, you do. It's a spirit of faith. Will your faith conquer every enemy, move every mountain, receive every promise, cast out every devil, conquer everything, do all the mighty works of the Lord and see God bring these things into being? Absolutely. You've got the same faith he has. Will your faith do that automatically? Depends. Subjunctive mood. You can have the faith of Jesus and fail because you haven't known these things or worked your faith and developed your faith and learned how to put it in operation to see results. God wants you to understand. He says, I prayed for your faith but not fail. And he said, when you're converted, strengthen the brethren. Otherwise, get these guys firm, set fast, and stable. And he has a command to him. He's saying, look, when you're converted, get all the rest of these guys stable, firm, set fast, fixed. That's what he wants every one of us. Every one of us are to get stable, strong, set fast, fixed. We are spiritual dynamos, operating authority, putting our faith in operation, conquering everything that comes against us. That's what he has for every one of us. You are a king. Kings command. Kings decree things. Kings speak things into being. Kings take dominion over every work of the enemy and command them to be removed. You cast out every devil. We cast them down from the heavenlies. We throw them down. Every time you speak, you know it's happening. Don't ever think, well, I wonder if it happened. You, your faith went nowhere. Never think that. That's the devil coming at in your mind. Why well, didn't see something happen? It's because you continually release your faith until the result is done. Remember Daniel prayed 21 days for the angel finally got through because the prince of was Persia was hindering. There will be a hindrance in the realm of the spirit from the devils because they're fighting. Jesus is commanding the demon to come out continually and he's not coming out. He's tearing at him. He rent him sore. He falls down like he's dead when he comes out. That's in the face of Jesus. Obviously, it was resisting and fighting. That shows you there's a warfare going on in the realm of the spirit. You know, the victory, the battle's the Lord's in the realm of the spirit. The victory's ours. We just need to keep our mouth going, speaking and understanding what to do to release him to see things happen. And what did Jesus do? He was upholding, bringing into being all things by the spoken word of his power. He was operating with authority and power, and that's what you and I are to do, the very same thing. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you that I am a king. I thank you. I will operate as a king with authority. As a king, I issue commands. I speak things into being. I make demands of what's due me. I take hold of promises. I speak to mountains. I cast out devils. I cast down the spirits from the heavenlies. I put my faith in operation by speaking commanding words. When I speak, it is happening in the realm of the spirit. As I continue to speak, it's continuing to happen in the realm of the spirit. As I continue to speak, 
I will see the victory, the manifestation in the natural when the enemies are smitten and driven out. I will see the promises come into manifestation as I keep speaking it into being, however long it takes until I see it manifest. I thank you. I'm going to develop my faith as a king by making commands, speaking promises into being. I thank you. I will make my mouth work for you. You commanded me to be having the faith of God. I will be having the faith of God because I will be speaking things into being. Thank you. I have the faith of Jesus. I am a king. I have the name of Jesus. I have the word of God. I have all the weapons to conquer every enemy. I will speak. I will be operating as a king. And I will see the manifestation of the rule and reign of God in me and through me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. You get a hold of this and start doing this. It'll change your life. And you'll start being used of God to change other people's lives as you're going to be speaking the word of God and speaking the promises into being. Hallelujah. Without getting established in this, are we going to see them do the same things that they did in the book of Acts? That's what they did. This is what we're going to do. This is what you're going to do. You are going to operate as a king. Father, I thank you and praise you that we have ears to, hears, ears to hear and eyes to see and the word. And we thank you for the truth of the word of God. We will command and speak things into being. Thank you that we'll be hearers and doers of this word. We will develop our faith. We will grow up in all things. And we will operate as a king in Jesus' name. Amen.